ESPN on ABC. Welcome to college football on ESPN presented by Arby's. Hard to do much better than a college football Saturday in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Ranked in the top four. They finished in the top four last year, of course, in front of a packed house at the big house to take on UConn. Hi again, everyone. Bob Shusen here with Roddy Jones and Chris Button will join us in just a moment. Quarterback controversies. Nothing dominates football headlines more than that. That's what you had here at Michigan coming into this offseason. It took camp. Took the first two weeks to decide, but seemed inevitable that eventually they would arrive at the young star, and they have. Yeah, the former five-star J.J. McCarthy gets to start today. And for Michigan, the schedule sort of allowed them to be creative with that quarterback discussion that you mentioned. But once you saw the talent against Hawaii, it was inevitable that J.J. McCarthy gave them a higher ceiling. And there is precedent for this. A, a team making the college football playoff and replacing an incumbent starter. Alabama did it in 2017. Jalen Hurts was a starter throughout that season to a tongue of Iloa comes into the national championship game he gets the start the next season that same season Clemson moved from Kelly Bryant who took him to the semifinals of the CFP to Trevor Lawrence a future number one overall pick and now for Michigan Kate McNamara was fantastic leading them to a win over Ohio State and that CFP appearance but JJ McCarthy as I said gives them that higher ceiling both of those previous two guys that we talked about Tua and Trevor top five picks JJ McCarthy has that kind of talent now can he produce and Chris but you had a chance to speak with J.J. yesterday. I did, and he's learned a lot over the last couple weeks. The message Jim Harbaugh sent him, though, you don't own this job, you only rent it. So you've got to continue to perform the way that you have. And to Kate McNamara, it was one day we are going to need you, so you better practice when your name is going to be called. The biggest life lesson J.J. McCarthy ever learned in his football career has been over the last two weeks, and it was you got to put your ego aside for the team, and they got to continue to do that. Well, it was certainly hard to watch J.J. McCarthy last year and then throughout camp this year and not have him be the clear-cut starter. He is, and he'll take the field against UConn, Michigan, and the Huskies in a moment. Hey, Mom. The Leo's Coney Island. Welcome back to Michigan, and you're watching the Big Ten on ABC. Michigan wins the toss, and they want the football. They want to put J.J. McCarthy, their star quarterback, out there to see if they can set the tone. Bob O'Shoes in here with Roddy Jones and Chris Button. And Roddy, your first trip to the big house, right? Tell me this isn't everything that college football should feel like on a Saturday. It, it looks and feels uh, like college football, like it's supposed to be. The entire community's out here, 100,000 plus for this game. Fired up to be here with you, partner. No way, Rulis will send it deep for UConn. And Roman Wilson is back at the goal line. And the flying Hawaiian will take it from the two and bring it out. And a pretty good return to the 28-yard line. Well, it was a point that you made all week. Players see. Players watch the throws that J.J. McCarthy was making, not just last week, but in practice. They know who the starter should be, and Jim Harbaugh said as much. And, and the snapshot that we got last week was incredibly impressive. 11 of 12 on the day, and throws like this, rolling to his left on the sideline, over a linebacker on the money. If that's what they're seeing every day in practice, and this decision was only going to go one way, and that's that J.J. McCarthy is the starting quarterback for the Michigan Wolverines. He's got Blake Corum to his left in the shotgun. Two by two, the receiver group, and McCarthy to throw on first down. And it's a quick out to A.J. Henning, and he picks up five. The thing, Bob, that's impressed me the most early on this season with J.J. McCarthy, last year he was mainly a runner when he had those packages that he came in, but the accuracy, we mentioned 11 of 12 last week. That one that it was incomplete was a drop. Play action, and a screen out to the edge to Roman Wilson. Gets a block, gets down the sideline. Wilson, tough to catch, all the way down inside the 30. Brought down at the UConn 28-yard line, he picks up 38. 
the most impressive it's great blocking by the receiver that's eric all the tight end on the inside and cornelius johnson on the outside and then the speed of Roman Wilson, Ronnie Bell in there too. Unselfish play by those wide receivers and Eric all the tight end, a guy that can flex out, is a great blocker both in line and in space. Blake clock winding down, down to two, down to one. And here's the first opportunity for Blake Corum. And he drives his way down to the 20-yard line and picks up eight. Speaking of Blake Corum, let's take a look, Roddy, at our impact players. Was an excellent player for them last year was Blake Corum, but played behind Hassan Haskins. It's his job this year, and I'm excited to see what he can do. And then on the other side, Jackson Mitchell. He's the leading tackler in the country, an excellent player. Jim Morris said that his preparation is as good as any linebacker that he's ever had. And this is a guy that's been the head coach of the Seattle Seahawks, the Atlanta Falcons, coached some really good ones at UCLA as well. He was in on that last tackle. And now it's Corum getting outside to the 15. Corum looking for the pylon. Touchdown. Check out right here, the tight end, Luke Schoonmaker. He's going to come across the formation and just get enough of the linebacker to let Blake Corum get around. And then on the outside, once again, the receiver, Andrell Anthony, throwing a block down the field. Michigan on the board for six. Blake Corum's third touchdown in as many games to start the season for Michigan. And it's 7-0 for the Wolverines. They made that look awfully easy. They certainly did. You got to give a lot of credit to the blocking, both the interior. But here, it's the blocking on the perimeter. Getting Blake Corm, the junior, in space. He finishes it and puts Michigan up by seven. College football on ABC is presented by Arby's. Arby's, we have the meats. Well, two top ten teams went down last week at home to unranked non-Power 5 opponents. Appalachian State, we've certainly seen App State do it before. That got game day to head to Boone, and what a scene it was. And what a scene it was indeed. And good on game day, spotlighting a school that's not normally one of on the regular rotation of game day spots. And DeRosa from the two yard line will call for a fair catch to bring it out to the 25. And Roddy, you'd have to think if UConn's going to have a chance to move the ball today, it's going to be Nathan Carter on the ground. Yeah, the, the country's third leading rusher. And he's a fantastic back. The balance. The short area quickness, he's got a little bit of burst and some long speed as well. He's a really competitive runner. Been really impressed watching him this week, and they're going to have to get him heavily involved with a young core around him that's really banged up. And those in the know in college football know who Nate Carter is. He's on the watch list for the Doak Walker Award. He has four career 100-yard games, two last year, already two this year. And a true freshman quarterback in Zion Turner to the air to begin. Tried to squeeze one into the sideline. Kevin's Clercius, the intended receiver. And it was broken up. Let's take a closer look at Zion Turner. 37-2 and two as a starter in high school. Won three state championships in a row at St. Thomas Aquinas. And you know, talking to Nick Charlton, the offensive coordinator, he said, look, when you play at St. Thomas, you play with really good players, but you also play against really good players as well. As Carter picks up a couple. So if there is a preparatory spot in high school football, Roddy, for a spot like this, certainly playing against the best that Florida has to offer is a great jumping off point, and Zion Turner certainly did that in high school. Well, the UConn coaches were very quick to tell us, look, this isn't his first time on a big stage. He played on ESPN in high school. So the moment's not going to be too big for him. The thing for Nick Charlton, they've got to find something downfield so that Michigan can't just load up the box to stop Nate Carter. And 
Burns. Robert Burns in motion on third down. A wide receiver. Tunnel screen goes nowhere. Aaron Turner is immediately dropped. So it will be a three and out to begin. That's a loss of five. And that's Junior Colson that read that perfectly and came up to make the stop. It's almost a race to the ball carrier between Junior Colson and Jamon Green. He stopped the feeding blocks on the outside, but Colson read it all the way. One of the best linebackers in the country able to make the play. Really good kick. That will drive A.J. Henning back to his own 25-yard line. Makes the first couple of Huskies miss, but eventually gets bottled up at the 26. Tommy Zosis made this up on special teams, 53-yard punt. Let's take a look at the strengths of both of these Michigan quarterbacks, and certainly the athleticism of J.J. McCarthy had a lot to do with why he won the job. It, it, it really does. It brings that quarterback run game as a bigger part of this offense, but he's got the full arsenal of throws, and he's fearless, man. He's going to take some chances, and if he can start to rain or if he can continue to rain when those chances come and when they don't, then he could be really special. And on the other side, Caden McNamara just so steady. Quick hitch out to Ronnie Bell. Boy, it's good to see Ronnie Bell back on a football field this year last season we called the opener our crew for Michigan against Western Michigan and he began with highlight real plays in the first quarter had a 76 yard touchdown reception a 30 plus yard punt return and then went down with a knee injury a torn ACL and was lost for the year not only did they lose a great player but they lost a lot of leadership a guy who's voted a captain on this team it's good to see him back McCarthy on second down and short, long out, and his receiver fell down. And that was dangerous as Cornelius Johnson lost his footing. Down to Chris. Bob, when Ronnie Bell went down last year, he told me that it was felt like he was looking through a tunnel, one really dark, long tunnel. And it wasn't until last week that he felt like he was on the other side of it. That's when he scored his first touchdown and gets in the end zone. He looked around and he goes, I just wanted to hug every single person. That's how excited and relieved I felt. It looked like he was going to be in the Heisman conversation last year based on how he played in the opener. So great to see Ronnie Bell back. He is to the far side left on third down. Pulling it down and getting tripped up behind the line is McCarthy. So it'll be a three and out forced by the UConn defense as Brandon Boye Randall made a five yard tackle for loss. I think J.J. McCarthy may have missed the read here. Good boy, a Randall, who was kind of playing in between. They're reading number zero. He comes down, then McCarthy keeps, but it seemed like he stayed out wide enough where he should have handed the ball off there. McCarthy maybe a little eager there early on. Show off the legs. So Brad Robbins on to punt for the first time. As Victor Rosa, the true freshman, is back deep to receive. Great kick from Robbins, driving Rosa down inside the 15-yard line. He watches it hop, and it takes a bit of a UConn bounce forward, but still, Robbins will put UConn inside their own 20-yard line after a 54-yard punt. A football Saturday here in Ann Arbor. They a three and out for super senior inside linebacker Ian Swenson and the UConn defense. Swenson wore a microphone for us in the pregame. About that time, Huncho. It's like getting locked in. We're all supposed to be here. supposed to be here, too. I really like this field, though. It feels like... It's kind of like uh, it's not as thick as some turf. Exactly. Like, you know I'm ready. I'm ready to go. Let's go, Huskies. Yes, sir. UConn country? Let's ride. <laughs> yes, sir, LBs. <laughs> We're going today. You seem pretty comfortable during pregame warm-ups here in the big house. Yeah, I like the affirmations, the positive affirmations, and then having a little bit of fun. You've gone country, let's ride. Well, we got to work on the facial expressions. Russ did it a little bit better that way. And we already have a change at quarterback. The redshirt sophomore transfer from Northern Arizona and UCLA, Kale Millen. Son of Hugh Millen, former NFL quarterback, is in to run this series for UConn. And it's up the middle for three yards on first down. 
And now it looks like Zion Turner's coming right back in. Kale Millen, we saw him have a packages in really every game this year after the injury to Taquan Roberson, the starting quarterback coming into the year. Much more of a run tell when he comes in. Only three passes thrown on the season. But Zion Turner, as you said, back in. Play action fake for Turner. Out to the sideline. That's good for a first down. Zion Turner to Aaron Turner. And moving the chains, the Huskies, a gain of eight. Aaron Turner had a big play for them last week to get play action going the other way. Turner is one on one with Mike Samer still. But a get open on a quick out. And it's a nice job by Jim Morris' team of picking up a first down. A little bit of momentum here for the Huskies. Now, Jim Mora told us after what this program has been through, he really felt like he needed to come to UConn and just wrap his arms collectively yeah. around his team. He's done that. His energy is infectious. Dropping the ball and picking it back up at losing yardage is Turner. Samer still came through and made the stop. It's a loss of four. So behind the chains, UConn after this mishap. Freshman just took his eyes off the ball as he goes to make the handoff to Victor Rosa, the running back. Drops the football, and after a big-time pickup, staying on schedule is going to be huge. Michigan's going to challenge this UConn offense. And Zion Turner hasn't really shown the ability to throw the ball down the field consistently the last couple weeks, so going to have to likely do that here. A full house backfield here. And on second and 14, it's a handoff to Rosa. And he gets maybe a couple of yards, Braden McGregor. He brought him down, so a negative play on first down, a couple of yards on second down, and now you're really behind the eight ball, third down and long. And look at how they threw the ball last week. Zion Turner was 14 of 17, but only seven total air yards on 17 attempts. Everything was at or behind the line of scrimmage. That's not going to cut it against a really talented, fast, big, strong Michigan defense. They're going to have to find something down the field. Michigan with a four-man front. Third down and 12. Now they show blitz. Sandra still creeps up to that right edge. It is only a four-man rush. Turner out of the pocket. Looking to extend the play. Gets to the sideline. Flips one. It caroms and it's almost intercepted on the carom. Bo Estes had it go right through his hands. And Makari Page on a dive almost came up with the pick. But it will be a punt for the Huskies. It's actually pretty decent protection, giving him a little bit of time. Good job by Turner of scrambling. Estes wouldn't have had the first down. With a broken tackle, could have gotten close. Good creativity by Turner. But Michigan covering everything up down the field. Well, the redshirt sophomore George Caratan with a terrific first punt as he did change field position for UConn. He'll have to do that. You'd have to think a bunch today. This, another pretty good kick. And not calling for a fair catch. A.J. Henning, and then the flag comes out. I did not see a fair catch signal. 42-yard punt. Damon Brinson looked like he timed that hit perfectly, and yet the flag came out. I'm with you, Bob. I didn't see a fair catch signal as well. It must have been really early if he did indeed throw it up there. Let's see what the call is. Kick, kick, in, kick catch interference, 15 yards. Kick, catch interference. Kicking team, number 20. 15 yard penalty. Automatic first down. Timeout. That's a big call. I mean, for UConn to give up 15 free yards by penalty and put Michigan at midfield. It's a tough one against the Huskies. Kevin Agani, Booger McFarlane in studio time now for our AT&T 5G studio update. The Lincoln first game since Scott Frost was fired. Mickey Joseph and Nebraska, the interim head coach facing Oklahoma. Casey Thompson to Troy Palmer there. Nice little route there by Trey Palmer, Kev. Dylan Gabriel scored on a 61-yard touchdown. We're tied at 7-all. Back to Bob and Roddy. All right, Kevin, thanks very much. Back to the air, J.J. McCarthy. Nice 
jump cut by Roman Wilson. A flag out as Wilson picked up 15. He made Malik Dixon Williams miss near the line of scrimmage, but we'll have to check the call. And they may tack on a few more yards to the end of this run. I think it might be a hold on Cornelius Johnson. Looked like the initial signal was it was against UConn. Let's see. Holding. Holding. Offense. Offense. Number six. Ten-yard penalty from the spot of the foul. First down. And the official pointed the wrong way, so that will hurt Michigan. But how about the pregame ritual, Chris, of J.J. McCarthy? Yeah, he goes through this entire routine. He meditates twice a day. He focuses on the mental side of his game a lot and continues to have this pre-snap mental checklist for areas that he focuses on. Joy, flow, no mental dialogue, and excitement. It's something that he's learned from his private quarterback coach in John Beck, who was also, by the way, the private quarterback coach for Zach Wilson, former BYU quarterback, now with the Jets. It's taught him something to, to focus on each day of the week, how he watches film, how he mentally prepares each day to get ready for Saturdays. Tell, just from your conversation with him, Chris, the maturity of this young man is impressive, although I don't know if I ever felt joy right before play. <laughs> play Corum on first and 11, breaks a couple of tackles and picks up two. Ian Swenson, by the way, limped off the field after that last play so one of the interior linebackers and a tackle machine for UConn he's trying to work it out as you can see over on the Husky sideline I'm so excited to be here we had a mic'd up you heard the opportunity and Jim Mora his team is so banged up most of those injuries coming on the offensive side of the ball he's hoping that Ian Swenson's absence will be very brief it looks like he is already tapping the defensive coaches saying I can get back in there. Maybe after this play, second down and long for Michigan. Play action. McCarthy, all day to throw. Finds a crosser on time for a first down. Ronnie Bell picks up 15. It's a really good read by J.J. McCarthy. Initially wanted to go deep. The post wasn't open, so he waits for the deep over route. And the ball placement, that ball's right on the eight of Ronnie Bell. He has no choice but to catch it. So good maturity by the young by the young sophomore not taking the deep shot not forcing it taking what's open Another long throw to the sideline this time AJ Henning. He's got another first down for Michigan Picked up 15 more He's been throwing to a lot of open receivers the past couple weeks but the fact that he's been putting the ball on the money and moving this offense consistently, the drive earlier today that he got stopped on made a mistake on a counter read play, probably should have handed it off. But the decision-making process of McCarthy has been something that stood out early in his career. Seven tight ends can play for Michigan. They've got three of them out there blocking for McCarthy. And McCarthy does damage now with his legs. It's first and goal. And this is the part of the offense that's just not as prominent with Cade McNamara. I don't see J.J. McCarthy doing this a lot today. But when he gets in the open field, he can move. Number 82, Max Bredesen out front. You get blocking downfield by Andrell Anthony. And Jim Harbaugh told us that he's legitimately like a 4-4, maybe low 4-5 kind of guy. You see Cade McNamara had to be tough for him but the talent of J.J. McCarthy just raises the explosiveness the ceiling of this Michigan offense. Trevor Keegan the left guard came to the sideline Giovanni El Hadi replaces him and this play blown dead at the line a timeout called by Jim Harbaugh from the Michigan sideline. 30 second charge timeout Michigan their first. So before first and goal, a timeout for the Wolverines coming up at 6 Eastern, 3 Pacific over on ESPN. It's Brian Kelly and his LSU Tigers hosting Mississippi State. And that's part of an SEC doubleheader followed by Miami, Texas A&M in College Station. Both games also available on the ESPN app. Miami offensive coordinator Josh Gaddis in his first season. Obviously, Michigan fans very familiar with his work. 
and it looks like he has really made a concerted effort, he and Mario Cristobal, to make Miami a physical running football team, something that they did some last year, but with a quarterback like Tyler Van Dyke, the pass game was sort of what they were known for a year ago, but they have really made a concerted effort to run the football. I'll be interested to see if they can do that against a stout Texas A&M front. And some starch taken out of that game with the App State win, of course, over Texas A&M. And the question again with Miami, are they for real? Blake Corum on first and goal down to the six-yard line. And what do you think? Is Miami starting to creep back to being Miami again? They're a better football team. But when you say creep back to being Miami, they're not going to contend for a national championship this year and likely not next year either. But the momentum around Miami and the investment that they have in that program now, I think they're on the right trajectory. Uh, it's a big one tonight. That is huge. A season maker if they can get a road win at Texas A&M. Second down and goal for Michigan from the six. Corum takes a hit his legs to the one yard line it will be third down and goal Malik Dixon Williams was able to make the stop for UConn Blake Corum showing a little bit of physicality on this run driving into the end zone looks like he's just it's a good call by the officials just short Michigan's gone big here you've got an extra lineman in the game you got three tight ends in the game Make it four tight ends as Bredesen, one of those tight ends, lines up as the fullback. For him again, over the pile, into the end zone for a Michigan touchdown. Two touchdowns for Corum to start things off for the Wolverines. A nice job by the Michigan offensive line getting a little bit of push opening up just a small gap Blake Corum sees it dives over the pile into the end zone he's two for two going in the end zone and also the short field for Michigan yeah UConn not done any favors by the officials with a tough kick catch interference penalty that allowed Michigan to begin the drive basically at midfield an eight play 54 yard touchdown drive and now it's time for today's Aflac trivia question. Aflac. Michigan is in a three-way tie with USC and James Madison for second in FBS at 53 and a half points per game. Now, without going on Google, without looking at your phone, <laughs> who right now leads the FBS? You know, off the top of your head, I I think it's Miami. If I'm not mistaken. Okay. We'll and see. They, they put up 70 against Bethune Cookman in week one. They only put up 30 against Southern Miss, but I think I think it's Miami. Although that wouldn't the, the math there doesn't doesn't add up now that I'm doing it in my head. What the Georgia Tech? I know. This math I should have done the math before. To you. I should have done the math before <laughs> I started saying who I thought it was. Is it Michigan? Oh, they're second. We'll find out. I'm not telling you. Don't look to me for the answer. I'm not cheating. Roddy Jones, Chris Button down on the field. I'm Bob Wachusen. 14 nothing. Michigan on top of UConn. Don't give me any tells. <laughs> and this will go into the end zone for a touchback and a chance once again to get an update with Kevin. Bob reminding our audience week three underway and take a look. Oh, we're going with the six box look here over on ESPN. You got Georgia in control against South Carolina. Syracuse 2 0 up 3 0 against Purdue over on ESPN 2. Cincinnati and ES on ESPN U. ACC Network that game. Virginia Tech up 20 0. That game started at 11 a.m. Back to you and Roddy. All right, Kev, thanks very much. A lot of college football across our networks. As you would imagine, busy college football Saturday. And let's see if UConn can get something going offensively down by two scores now. True freshman and true freshman in the backfield. Zion Turner with a little zone read handoff to Victor Rosa. No gain on first down. Chris Jenkins, part of the group that held the point of attack for that Michigan defense. Junior Colson flowed that way as well. 
Michigan defensive line is different than it was a year ago, replacing Aiden Hunch Hutchinson and David Ajabo. They're not going to be ex as explosive on the edge rushing the passer, but in terms of up the middle, being stout against the run, I, I feel like they can be as good as they were a year ago. Rosa again, lost the football, and Michigan's got it. Chris Jenkins jumps on top. Check that, not Jenkins. George Rooks was able to find the loose ball behind the line of scrimmage. And Michigan gets a gift takeaway, and they're in business just outside the red zone. True freshman quarterback, true freshman running back, and Victor Rosa just doesn't secure it as a running back. Sometimes you get a little excited. You want to start to make your moves and start to read the defense before you have the ball secured, especially when you're in a big environment against a historic team, and it costs Victor Rosa there. So for UConn, 15-yard penalty on the last drive. Change of possession gives Michigan the short field. And now they drop the football and give Michigan another short field at the 22-yard line. McCarthy, a swing pass. A.J. Hennig, speed down to the 10-yard line. And it looks like it'll be first and goal again for Michigan, a gain of 12. The amount of weapons that this Michigan offense has this year is, is really impressive. And honestly, the ceiling of this offense and how they use these guys is only going to be limited by the creativity of the two offensive coordinators. When you have a guy like A.J. Henning that's backing up Roman Wilson and Cornelius Johnson and Ronnie Bell, all who are flexible players, and they have a lot at their disposal. Up the middle goes Henning. He's kind of a Swiss Army Knife player. They'll line him up all over, sometimes as a receiver out wide in the slot, they'll put him in the backfield, that time acting as a running back, and Ian Swenson brought him down after a gain of a couple. There's offensive coordinator, co-offensive coordinator Matt Weiss, who also coaches the quarterbacks. He talked to us yesterday. Donovan Edwards out in this game, a guy who's another Swiss Army knife, but A.J. Henning slots right in behind him. You mentioned a guy who's got a kind of running back build, good returner, very flexible piece. Play action. McCarthy off his back foot. Floats one end zone. Incomplete. Ronnie Bell thinks he made an incredible catch staring down a cheering section behind the end zone, but the officials say no. He didn't control it. The ball hit the ground. Let's take another look. The coverage is all over Ronnie Bell. It's a heck of a throw, giving him a chance. And yeah, I agree with the ruling on the field, at least from that angle. Looks like that ball comes down, hits the ground before he has a chance to secure it. But even getting to that ball, that's impressive. It's good coverage by Trey Wortham, too. So it will be third down and goal. As Ronnie Bell came that close to making a highlight real catch. Play clock down to two, down to one. And McCarthy again tried to get the snap off before the play clock went to zero. Charge timeout, Michigan. But Jim second. Harbaugh ran down the sideline to call a timeout before a delay of game penalty. So now we have an opportunity to answer our Aflac trivia question. Aflac. Michigan in a three way tie with USC and James Madison for second in FBS at 53 and a half points per game. And of course, Roddy Jones. Serious ACC bias, as you would imagine, with yeah, his answer before. Course, but of course. we're going to head to the Big 12. Oh! At 55 and a half points per game. We're talking about Bill Self's crew, are we? This is Lance Leipold's crew, right? <laughs> Bill Self's crew averaged about 78 a game, won yeah, the national championship. <laughs> That's a Kansas with a big win going to West Virginia getting a win up there Lance Leipold's done an excellent job with that program it's a guy whose names have floated around a little bit and big 10 circles with the Nebraska job open but Kansas yeah I wouldn't have gotten that you could have given me about 129 guesses and I probably wouldn't have gotten it so now third down and goal chance for UConn to get a red zone stop as McCarthy looking end zone out of the pocket now buying some time fires one that's knocked down Sagging back in coverage and in position to make the play is Chris Sheeran. And now it's fourth and goal for the eight-yard line. How about the job by the UConn defense? 
Michigan starts at the 22-yard line, and they'll hold to a field goal attempt. J.J. McCarthy thought about throwing the dig route. Probably wisely didn't do that. Would have been better off tucking and running and putting the ball in danger there. But the UConn defense, a couple of plays with some really good coverage, forcing Michigan to kick a field goal. The Mizzou transfer, and the nickel safety Chris Sheeran gets the pass defensed for Jim Mora. So it is a chip shot field goal attempt that is put through by the Groza winner from last year, Jake Moody. And Michigan now has a three score lead with 38 seconds to go in the opening quarter. Well, Kate McNamara, of course, a quarterback last season for Jim Harbaugh's team. And they won 12 games for the first time since their national championship season. The first time since 2011, they got a win over Ohio State. They would win the Big Ten championship for the first time since 2004 and make the college football playoff with Kate McNamara starting all 14 games last season. And, you know, we talked with Matt Weiss, as you said, the new co-offensive coordinator. And he said it's really hard to have a conversation with a winning quarterback that's done nothing wrong. It's not like Kate McNamara went out there and made mistake after mistake and cost Michigan. Right. Just the eye test tells you which player in a true meritocracy deserved the job. When you're out of school like Michigan, at every position across the field, they are trying to out-recruit you and your performance. Just so happens for Cade McNamara, they found a guy in J.J. McCarthy that talent-wise just gives them a little bit more possibilities. I guess there's a difference between the guy that's very efficient, maybe a game manager, and a guy that's just a, a flat-out difference maker with his talent. They didn't really have the downfield passing game consistently. They didn't have the element of quarterback run as well. Both of those they have with J.J. McCarthy. Coming up this week on Sunday, NFL Countdown. Before the Super Bowl champion Rams look to bounce back, a one-on-one -on -one with Matthew Stafford. And Randy Moss ranks the best catches from today's college football action. It's all tomorrow when you start your Sunday with NFL Countdown at 10 a.m. Eastern on ESPN. I was watching a terrific documentary earlier today in the room that Jeremy Schaap did on Drew Bledsoe when he lost his job to Tom Brady back in 2001 as Zion Turner runs right and gets knocked out of bounds after a gain of five. And it just drove home, I guess, the oldest theme in the world. When you are a deserving, quote-unquote, backup quarterback and you know that you're good enough to play, there's just natural feelings, I'm sure, of bitterness when you lose your job. Yeah, and Kate McNamara is a, is a captain on this football team, so I'm sure this team was looking to see how he would react. And by all accounts, he's been a true professional about it. But there have to be some of those feelings of disappointment when you're supplanted after having a great season a season ago. Second and five, what might be the final play of the quarter? Victor Rosa brought down after a gain of three. And there is a flag down near the line of scrimmage. Holding. Offense, number 62. 10-yard penalty from the previous spot. Second down. So another negative that UConn just can't afford as we approach the end of the first quarter. And Cade McNamara and J.J. McCarthy at least entering today. This season, McCarthy's been almost perfect. He, he was fantastic, albeit against lesser competition than Cade McNamara faced. And that was sort of the point that the coaches told us. This wasn't based on one game. We saw a snapshot of what the coaches have seen for 29 practices in fall camp and 15 practices in the spring as well. That'll take us to the end of the first quarter. So Michigan, a couple of Blake Corum touchdown runs. They've got a 17 to nothing lead here at the Big House. And we'll come back after these messages and a word from our ABC stations. Welcome back to ESPN College Football, presented by Arby's. Yeah. Uh, you got to you got to be better than that. I mean, that's why you need the Georgia Tech guy out there, right? Like I mean, the, the guy that knows a little something about engineering to help you with Jenga. Really looks structurally stable. <laughs> Victor Rosa starts off the second quarter with a gain of about six. 
So it'll be third down and nine. Bob Shoes and Roddy Jones and Chris Budden. Here at the big house, Kale Millen in for a play, and now Zion Turner will come back in for third down and nine for the Huskies. I thought that was an opportunity maybe to take a shot with Kale Millen down the field. Michigan's going to key on the run every time he's in. Going into with Zion Turner. There's a slant tipped up in the air. It should have been intercepted with a flag down as well. A couple of flags thrown. Junior Colson had a chance at a pick on the carom. But we're going to have to check the penalty marker. DJ Turner got there a little bit too early. He was eager. Went through the receiver's back. You go from potential interception to likely a first down for UConn. Interference, defense number five. Ball will be placed at the spot of the foul. Automatic first down. That's the first third down conversion for UConn. They had one first down in the first quarter. There's number five, DJ Turner driving on the route. Just gets to Nigel Fitzgerald a half a beat too early. It's a good break on the football. And in that situation, you got to figure out a way to get around the receiver and bat the ball down, not going through his back. And it does give UConn a first down. A four-yard penalty, but good enough, obviously, for an automatic first down. Robert Burns continues to act as the tailback. A little play, fake, and a swing pass by Turner that misses Dejon Harrison. It'll be second down and ten. Uh, in a perfect world, Zion Turner would have liked to have dished that ball right away, but Jalen Harrell got in the throwing lane and prevented that. But, but Bob, we haven't seen... Nathan Carter since early on in this game it's been Victor Rosa and Robert Burns this is already a thin group with Devonte Houston out Brian Bruton out for the year the two backup running backs so we could be seeing UConn with their third, fourth and fifth string running backs in this game now UConn decimated by injuries as Burns gets tripped up near the line of scrimmage and falls forward for three well not only are they fighting through injuries already in this game? But they lost their starting quarterback, Taquan Roberson, to a torn ACL in the opener against UConn, uh, Utah State. They lost Keelan Marion to a broken collarbone, their second best wide receiver, arguably, on the first touchdown pass of Roberson's career against Utah State. They lost Cam Ross, who might have been their best wide receiver coming into the season, to a broken foot back in camp. They've been hurt on the offensive line as well. And you've got Zion Turner, a true freshman, at quarterback on third down and seven. He's going to lob one, one on one to the sideline, incomplete. Sandra still good coverage on Jacob Flynn. Nick Charlton told us it's going to come down to one on one matchups. Michigan's going to play man to man, challenge you down the field. I like Zion Turner taking the chance, throw it up and see if your receiver can make the play. But Sainer still, the converted receiver who's been excellent at defensive back early in this season, had great coverage, and it forces the UConn punt. So George Carrington will kick it away once again. A.J. Henning deep to receive. Play clock goes down to zero. They get it off. It is loose at about the 39-yard line. Scooped up and running the near side. And getting bumped out of bounds. Looks like Jamon Green. But check that. Blocked by Caden Kolasov. So a blocked punt. And Michigan is in plus territory again. There's Caden Kolasar. They overload that gap in the punt protection, and he's able to get right through. Takes it off the punter's foot, which is exactly what you're supposed to do. And Michigan coming up with a big special teams play. Another situation, Bob, where Michigan gets great field position. 
due to a mishap on UConn's side. Colasar blocked it, and Kalel Mullings was able to return it to the 18-yard line of UConn. It's honestly, this the score 17 nothing is. It's not really indicative of how this game has gone. Michigan's had a lot of great field position so far. Corum. Down to about the 12 yard line. Yeah, kick catch interference penalty that gave them the short field. And they would go down and score. And just a sloppy exchange with a couple of freshmen in the offensive backfield and a fumble by Rosa gave Michigan a short field and now a block punt gives them another short field at the 18 yard line they start this drive and it's second down and six at the 12 no, at four pardon me at the 12 slip pass out to the edge to Ronnie Bell and he is brought down just inside the one yard line first and goal Ian Swenson saved the touchdown. Defensive back covering Ronnie Bell on the motion just gets lost. I mean, watch him. He's got to flip his hips. Caleb Anthony come back around. Ronnie Bell's open as soon as the ball snapped. And they'll hand it off to Blake. Call up the middle for an easy touchdown. His third of the first half. Michigan taking advantage of the short field. Last time they had it, the UConn defense stood up inside the red zone, but some good play calling, getting Ronnie Bell open, and then an offensive line just takes over inside the five. You had to think UConn, to stay in this game, would need to play mistake-free football. They have done anything but, and Michigan takes advantage again to make it 24 nothing. They absolutely have, Bob. As you said, they had to play mistake-free, but Michigan has been the one to take advantage. First on special teams, you get a blocked punt, gives you great field position, quick pass to Ronnie Bell, gets you down close, and Blake Corum with a hat trick on the day. Let's take a look at the Taco Bell Live Moss student section. Student sections across the country are competing to be the Live Moss student section of the year all season long. That record. Now they've never lost to a non-conference opponent. Mike Bear, our low end zone operator running that camera. And, all right, maybe he should get a Chalupa as well, right? He's, he's right there in the Live Moss student section. He is living Moss. <laughs> Daughter's getting married next week. Congrats on that. But in the meantime, just uh, make sure you, you watch out for the students around you if they get too rowdy. Well, he picks up the hazard pay for being down there. He's got a wedding to pay for next week. Does Mike Barron's? <laughs> Seems like everything's pretty civil so far. Oh, got their, wolf, their Wolverines have a 24 nothing lead with about three minutes gone by in the second quarter. Got to be pleased by that. Moody booms another kickoff through the back of the end zone for a touchback. Let's check in with Kevin. Bob, time now for a mayhem moment brought to you by Allstate. To Syracuse, Boog we go. And after a Purdue touchdown, Jason Simmons gets the loose ball. No doubt, Kevin. Right now, we have a convoy going down the sideline. Except seven guys from Syracuse say, you know what? We're just going to run to run. We're not going to block anybody. <laughs> oh, he gets no! the 18-yard line. Right now, 6-3 over on ESPN2. Purdue with the lead. Back to you, Bob and Roddy. All right, Kevin, thanks very much. 12.08 to go in the first half. And for the first time in a while, Nathan Carter is back on the field with this UConn offense. It's a good sign for UConn. There's a little bit of an absence that he's back in the game. Again, their best player, leading rusher in the country. And he'll take the ball here. Looking for room and not finding any. 
wrapped up by the freshman Derek Moore. And Chris Button, you had eyes on Nathan Carter down there. What'd you see? Yeah, working through an undisclosed injury, but he was hustling down the sidelines, doing great fine high knees, trying to work through something. Went up to the coaching staff and he said, I'm good to go. And then they banged on his shoulder pads. He is a guy that likes to play angry, and you can see that when he's out there. That was only his second carry of the game. Carried it once on their opening possession, and now he's back on the sideline again. High pass for Victor Rosa. A miss from Zion Turner, and now it's third down and ten. Oh, and Zion. Zion Turner had a receiver open on the sideline. Michigan brings pressure off the edge, expecting the safety to get out there. You've got Clef Kevin's Calarius standing on the sideline all by himself. And Jim Morris got to be confused as to why they didn't get out there, but now they're in a third and long situation again. Zion Turner, two for seven for three yards passing. What's the old saying about true freshmen? The best thing about freshmen is they become sophomores. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe he'll just see it a little bit better the more experience he gets. Tunnel screen incomplete right through the hands of Jacob Flynn. That was a fastball thrown by Zion Turner. And Jacob Flynn had to go right through his mitts. And it will be a punt after a three and out. And, and that's why you can't miss the layups. It puts you in a situation where Michigan's got a going to have an opportunity to pin their ears back. So you go with a screen, a tunnel screen as a counter to it. And whether it was caught or not, I mean, Michigan was going to stop it. Three guys right there. But if you're able to hit Clarcius earlier in the play, then maybe you get maybe you get a third and short. Polisar got the block on the last punt attempt by Carrington. This time he gets away a line drive spiral that Henning will make a fair catch on back at his own 28-yard line. 48-yard punt. Back to the offense. Michigan when we come back. Attention. College football presented by Arby's on ABC is brought to you by Champion. Giving women the confidence to play by their own rules. Let's go back to some college tape of our man Dan Orlovsky through for over 10,700 yards in 46 games in his career with the Huskies drafted by the Lions back in 2005 and he'll be on the call of one of our two games on Monday Night Football this week Buffalo take on Derrick Henry and the Titans 715 Eastern 415 Pacific on ESPN and ESPN Deportes then the second game with Justin Jefferson and the Vikings in Philly to take on Jalen Hurts and the Eagles at 830 right here on ABC as well as on ESPN plus and ESPN Deportes and a couple of pretty good pass catchers going head to head on Monday night. No kidding. The debut for A.J. Brown is it was as advertised. C.J. Stokes, a freshman right up the middle, plows his way for 11 and a first down. A.J. Stokes got there really excited about great burst up the middle. And with Donovan Edwards out, he's going to get an opportunity get some run here today. And Blake Corum's already tied his career high with three touchdown runs here in the first half alone. So J.J. McCarthy still in at quarterback. And this time Stokes brought down behind the line. Loss of a couple. Eric Watts with the tackle for loss. We'll see if we see Cade McNamara at some point today. And Michigan with Colorado State, Hawaii, and UConn, their first three games. It's almost, Roddy, like an NFL preseason okay. for them. Able to work a lot of different bodies in and out of games until they get into the Big Ten schedule, which, of course, begins next week. And it's an opportunity for you to try some stuff out, whether it's packages, plays. You can put some stuff on film that make teams prepare for it, but also an opportunity to hold a lot of stuff back. Stokes bounces outside and gets bottled up. He loses three more. Boye Randall held the edge. Got some help from Jackson Mitchell. You know, I was really curious to see how this Michigan offensive line was. UConn defensive line is a pretty decent crew. They're big up front, and they play pretty well in their front. 
over the course of their early season. And up to this point, Michigan's offensive line has done a nice job, but you can see there the talent that UConn has. Third down at 14. A lot of speed to the wide side of the field for Michigan. McCarthy out of the pocket. Still extending the play, looking downfield. And he'll be brought down. Brandon Boye Randall is there again. A loss of a couple more, and it will be a Michigan punt. There was just absolutely nobody open down the field for Michigan. J.J. McCarthy bought as much time as he could. The offensive line does a decent job, only rushing three, but there's so many bodies clogging up lanes. And then Boye Randall, he's having himself a little game. They track down the quarterback. So Brad Robbins gets away a wobbly kick. Victor Rosa will let it bounce, and it will take a Michigan roll inside the five down at about the four-yard line. A 63-yard punt, and we'll come back in eight seconds. Now a look from Ram Trucks. Ram trucks built to serve. So UConn's defense gets a stop. But then a mistake you'd have to say from Victor Rosa letting that ball hit the ground at the very least. Call for a fair catch and field the ball. If you do that, you save your team about 20 yards or so of field position, and now they're up against it at their own four-yard line. And they're going to have to be careful. We've already seen a fumbled exchange. We've seen Zion Turner have some trouble with a snap as well. This Michigan defensive line has really controlled the line of scrimmage when they've been on the field. Now Nate Carter is in as the lone setback. Straight ahead run. Now to about the nine-yard line. That's a good pickup on first down of five yards when you're probably anticipating run. And it's a good job by Christian Haynes, the right guard, of opening up a hole to the weak side of that offensive line. You're right. This It's a run situation all the way. The ability to be able to pick up some yardage and, and cut the distance in half for a first down, it's a big-time play for UConn. The toss this time to Carter. Out to the 12-yard line or so. They'll actually mark him down at the 11. Jalen Harrell, Junior Colson combined on the tackle to make it third down at three. Surprised UConn hasn't done more of that stuff today out there on the edge, trying to get away from the middle of that Michigan defense. That's what they felt like they had a bit of an advantage. And Cale Millen, backup quarterback in the game. We've seen him twice, and it's been two quarterback runs. Let me go back to that here. Well, Michigan crowds the box. They are certainly sensing run on third down and three. They've got ten players. And now nine up within about four yards of the line of scrimmage. Nolan will give it to Rosa. Rosa with a push short of the first down line to gain by a yard. So it will be a three and out even after the five yard gain on first down another stop for Chris Jenkins and Jim Mora not pleased with something that he saw from his offense on that one but Chris Jenkins number 94 for Michigan did a good job on the front side not allowing any push forcing Rosa back in and being able to bring him down. But with Cale Millen in the game, I mean, you said it. There's just so many players around the line of scrimmage. It's going to be tough to do anything, even in short yardage. So A.J. Henning, returnable from the 39-yard line. Breaks a couple of tackles. Henning to midfield. Left speed. Breaks another tackle. Henning down the sideline. Looking for the pylon after a cutback. He's got a Michigan touchdown. individual effort by A.J. Henning. Watch the number of missed tackles. One, two, three guys have a chance at him. And then when you get in the open field and you allow a punt returner like that to have space, 
It is bad news for a return team. Four broken tackles by A.J. Henning. And another special team spectacular play by the Wolverines. So Michigan dominating in all three phases. 31 to nothing with 6.05 to go in the first half. It's been all Wolverines here early. Gets a little bit of help down the field. He didn't need a ton of it. But A.J. Henning plunges into the end zone. Go up 31 to nothing. Jim Mora looking for answers. Understandable frustration for Jim Mora on the UConn sideline. And Roddy, it has to be hard to come into a game knowing you have little to no chance to win, even if you play perfectly, and to still see his team with so many self-inflicted wounds in the first half. It was going to be an uphill climb, something that Jim Mora talked to us about this week, no matter what. But you just don't want to see the mistakes that are controllable, turning guys loose on a punt, on punt block, giving up a punt return touchdown. That is the frustrating stuff. Back to Kevin Nagandi. I'm reminding our audience, ESPN Family of Network's got you covered. Plenty of action as we go to the six box here over on ESPNU. Cincinnati down to Miami of Ohio. Meanwhile, number one Georgia complete control at South Carolina. Highlights of all these games coming your way at the half. Back to you, Bob and Roddy. All right, Kev, thanks very much. So Michigan opening up a 31 to nothing lead. As A.J. Henning brings back a punt return for a touchdown, the first for Michigan since 2018 when Donovan Peoples-Jones had one against Nebraska. Back to the offense for UConn. And back to the zone read. And then a little RPO for Zion Turner. He keeps it himself and picks up a couple. Kind of set up almost a screen pass there. And Turner, a couple blockers out in front. Bill Miller and trots back into the game. Zion Turner hasn't left yet. Hasn't yet left the field. Aaron Turner had a big play last week. Big reception, 56 yarder on a screen pass. Hale Millen, straight quarterback run. And he lost a half yard. Chris Jenkins tripped him up. This Michigan defense has not allowed a point in the first half, and it doesn't look like the way they're playing right now. They'll allow one today. How about James Madison being the other one? Let's get a look at Jesse Minter in his first year at defensive coordinator. Coming over from Vanderbilt, has having been with John, Jim Harbaugh in the past, having been with John Harbaugh as well with the Ravens. Zion Turner back in to take the shotgun snap on third and long. Over the middle, slant, bobbled and dropped. Walloped. Now, with a big hit on Carter. Carter's one on one with RJ Moten and has an opportunity. If he secures it, then you're able to turn up field and probably have something for Makari Page before that hit comes. But because of the bobble, you're not able to gather yourself. Not only do you not catch the ball, but then you take the big hit. It's a tough one for the running back. If you're able to secure it, that's almost surely a first down. Sixth punt already for Carrington. Henning brought back the last one for a touchdown. This one, a sliding fair catch. At the 40-yard line. Beautiful day in Ann Arbor to watch a football game. And they are a happy group at the Big House. With DirecTV. State Farm Halftime Report just minutes away. Booger and Kevin in studio, 31-0. What yeah. can you evaluate from this game? Well, the biggest thing is for the quarterback, and as the world turns in Michigan, is make sure that J.J. McCarthy move the ball around, be efficient. More importantly, don't turn the football over. He's done that today. 8 of 11, 113 yards in the air. Right now, the big house is rocking. By the way, we'll evaluate Georgia. They look really good. Highlights coming your way. Bob? All right, Kev, thanks very much. As J.J. McCarthy is still out there, and he'll throw a swing pass to a wide-open Ronnie Bell down the sideline. Bell breaking tackles. Bell down inside the 35 to the UConn 32-yard line. He picks up 27.
mentioned Ronnie Bell's game last year, one catch, 76 yards and a touchdown. He looks as good as he did then as well. UConn has a little bit of an alignment mistake. Two defenders, Michigan's got two blockers over there, so there's nobody for the ball carrier. Ronnie Bell makes them pay. Play action on the rollout, McCarthy. Fires one across his body on the move, wide open. Down inside, the five-yard line goes Schoonmaker to the one. Boy, there is the special ability of McCarthy to make plays on the move. We hadn't seen it yet this game, but he has to get around the defender, so you see the burst. And after that burst, the difficulty, the level of difficulty that it is to throw back across your body accurately to your tight end so that he can do something with it, get down the field. You knew we'd see it at some point. Kind of been hidden so far, but you mentioned it. That's the talent that J.J. McCarthy brings. Dominant first half, as you would expect for Michigan. As Corum is the eye back looking potentially for his fourth rushing touchdown of the first half, and he has got it. A career high in rushing touchdowns for Blake Corum. And we still have three minutes to go in the second quarter. So the career high in the first half. I think the offensive performance, Michigan certainly has been helped by special teams. But you see drives like that where they're just so efficient. It's just a little snapshot. You have Ronnie Bell, who's a weapon. J.J. McCarthy out there on the perimeter, throwing it to Luke Schoonmaker, who's one of four tight ends we've seen today. And then Blake Corum plunging in the end zone. Full arsenal on display for Michigan. That's Roddy Jones. I'm Bob Lashusen. Chris Button is with us as well. 38 to nothing for Jim Harbaugh's team. And well, you just heard Booger and Kevin talking about the first half that J.J. McCarthy has played. Booger gave his assessment. What's yours so far and what you've seen from McCarthy now in person? I think it's been pretty good in terms of, of managing what this game is. I mean, coming in, one of the things you have to check yourself from doing and saying hey look I'm gonna go out there and, and be able to tear this team up because you watch film all week and you know that UConn's going to be overmatched but I think he's managed it there had to be emotions getting the being named the full-time starter and I think we've seen JJ McCarthy so far going the right places with the football and being able to deliver accurately for the most part so I, I would give him a passing grade so far today he's 10 of 13 for 172 yards and obviously, Cade McNamara, we would expect to see him at some point in the second half. And we'll see after halftime how Jim Harbaugh approaches things, if he lets his starters go back there, back out there to continue to play. Because this is, as you would have at the end of an NFL preseason, kind of that final dress rehearsal before their regular season an opener here at the Big House next week against Maryland. I think I'd actually like to see J.J. McCarthy come out for a series in the second half so you could go in, make adjustments with your quarterback, see what that communication's like, and then go out and play at least a drive in that second half. You mentioned it. Treat it like it is that last preseason game before you get Maryland next week. We'll say Michigan had a luxury that not a lot of teams in the country have. Having three opponents that are overmatched per metrics, it was the easiest non-conference schedule in the country, so you're able to treat it a little differently than you would otherwise. A line drive kick from Moody. Takes a hop through the back of the end zone. Down to Chris. Uh, when I talked to McCarthy yesterday, he was extremely appreciative of the year to develop sitting behind Kate McNamara. He said, one of the biggest things I've learned is I have to be a more assertive vocal leader. It's not in my nature. I'm a guy that, hey, if you need me, you can come talk to me. But I'm not the guy that's going to get in your face. And that's a lot of the reason why Kate McNamara was named a captain, is that ability to be able to lead vocally, which J.J. says he still needs to work on. And the development year has helped quarterbacks across the country. I mean, think about it. Bryce Young had a developmental year sitting behind Mac Jones. You had C.J. Stroud get a year to sit there and learn from a guy who's done it in college. Under pressure, heaving one to the sideline is Zion Turner. 
He looked up and Mike Sanders still was right in his grill. It'll be second down and 10. I have to say, look, I'm the radio broadcaster for the Jets. So I have seen a lot of what we're seeing Zion Turner go through right here <laughs> with Jet quarterbacks. But it's amazing that that developmental year is now more common in college football than it is in the NFL. Yeah. I mean, there's such pressure in the National Football League when you draft a quarterback in the first round, particularly high in the first round, to put that rookie right on the field right away. And as Carter gets tripped up near the line, picks up about three, you wonder if at some point will there be some cycle in the NFL where teams will get back to saying, boy, having a rookie quarterback that we want to have be our guy for 10, 12, 15 years, just have that first year to watch, take a step back, tutor, and prepare, you know, maybe that would benefit guys. I think it absolutely would. Think of all the things that a college freshman or an NFL rookie are adjusting to off the field. You're living in a new place. You're having to figure out what your routine's going to be. And then on the field, it's a step up in competition and preparation. Turner scrambling on third down. Has some room to run. He's going to tuck it under. And he will pick up the first down and more. And gets bumped out of bounds at UConn's own 42-yard line. 14-yard scramble on third down for Zion Turner. Michigan's pass rush not able to get home with four. You saw Mike Morris coming through late. But Zion Turner able to break the pocket, pick up the first down. And, and with this Michigan defense, that's really going to be the question going forward. How do you replace Aiden Hutchinson and David Ajabo? How do you get pressure on the quarterback? Who's going to be the guy to step up? And I think it's going to be more of a collective effort than it was last year. There's Mike Morris. And if there's one guy that looks like he might be ready to take that role for Michigan, it's probably him. And he is bringing the pressure here. But Turner gets out of the pocket, dodging tacklers and slides after a gain of two. <laughs> It's a pretty good job by Zion Turner of stepping up in the pocket, letting Mike Morris get past. You're going to see Mike Morris on the right side of your screen. It's a nice job with the burst. Can't quite bend the edge enough to be able to get to Zion Turner. But you said it. I mean, Morris looks apart in run support. He's been excellent. Big question still to answer is in Big Ten play, you're going to be able to get pressure against that level tackle. Second down and eight. They'll run it right up the middle with Carter. He's got a first down. You've got a minute three to go in the first half. UConn has all three timeouts. They've let a lot of time bleed off the clock. Maybe just try to get to the locker room. But now you've crossed the 50-yard line. It looks like they'll go more up-tempo and be a little more aggressive. Why not? Down 38 nothing. Exactly. You've got all your timeouts. Get a little bit more pep in your step. You don't want to give Michigan a lot of time. But as you said, you likely don't have it now. Turner back shoulder to the sideline incomplete hoping for Jacob Flynn. So that'll stop the clock with 42 seconds to go in the half. DJ Turner pretty good coverage. He's their most experienced player in terms of snaps last year there at corner was good coverage. But Flynn had a chance at it coming back to the football. But DJ Turner's a guy that they feel like is an NFL level corner. We were told by the coaches he's the fastest guy on the team. You can see the coverage skills there. Well, Zion Turner has missed on his last eight pass attempts and now a false start. This was the first time in the game that UConn has crossed the 50-yard line, and now that five-yard penalty is going to put them back on their side of the field. False 50. start. Offense number 62. Five-yard penalty. Second down. So Noel Oforti Diadu costs them five. Second down at 15. I think it's unfair for them to single out guys like that when the entire line moves. Just call it on all of them. Or, or the center who didn't snap the ball. Turner wants the screen and it's red. Michael Barrett was right there to meet Nathan Carter as the ball arrived. It will be third down at 15. Watch how Michael Barrett reads this screen right there in the middle. And he is all over this. As soon as he sees the lineman release, he triggers, absolutely destroys the running back before you're able to get the before he's able to catch the football.
Four man rush on third and 15. There's the check down. Carter's got it. Brought down inbounds at the 43 yard line. And let's see if either team spends a timeout here. And the clock is stopped with 28 seconds to go. And it'll be a timeout for UConn as they spend their first. And they're going to go for it, obviously, on fourth down at six. Coming up, six Eastern, three Pacific over on ESPN. LSU hosting Mississippi State, a continuous day of SEC football on ESPN. The nightcap, Miami and Texas A&M in College Station. Both games available on the ESPN app as well. And it might be fourth down and six. UConn might be blanked to this point in the first half, but this drive alone, they've got more total yards than they had to this point in the first half. Zion Turner's ledge had a nice run up the middle by Nate Carter. So some positives going in the halftime for Jim Morris' team. They've got a fourth and six, though. It's gonna be a bunch formation at the top of your screen. See Zion Turner goes that way. He looks for the slant right instead, incomplete. Tried to squeeze it into a very tight window, and getting back to muddy that picture was Braden McGregor, who dropped off the line. Devin's Clarcius was the intended receiver. 24 seconds to go in the half. It's a really good disguise. First off, the coverage on the outside. I'm not sure you're able to catch that. Wilk Johnson was all over it. But as you said, Bob, Braden McGregor lined up at defensive end, and it looked like it was going to be one on one on the outside. Slant may be there. Well, he drops underneath and makes that throw almost impossible. And now the Michigan faithful criticized, at least some for booing Cade McNamara. The last time he was out there, you could see as the players rallied to McNamara's defense, he takes over at quarterback, gets a standing ovation, and he will get hit and dropped. And we'll see if that takes us to halftime. No, Michigan's going to spend a quick timeout with 14 seconds to go in the half as Eric Watts is able to get his first sack of the season. Eric Watts against Trente Jones, who has had moments of lapses early in this season where he's allowed some pressure. Really talented player. J.J. McCarthy is sitting on the sideline watching as his right tackle allowed a sack. But I want to go back to what the Michigan fans just did for Cade McNamara. As you said, very fairly criticized last week for booing when McNamara came into the game when they wanted J.J. McCarthy. But with what Cade McNamara has done for this program, elevating them to the level that they were last year, top 14 in the country, CFP appearance, Big Ten champions, beating Ohio State. This is what he deserved last week, and I'm glad that the fans gave him that, that ovation when he came in the game today. Put a couple of extra seconds back up on the clock. Second and 15 with 16 seconds to go before halftime. It's a UConn blitz. Picked up. McNamara, long throw to the sideline. To pull it in is Ronnie Bell. An 18-yard game. They rule them out of bounds. If so, either way, they're going to be able to get another playoff. And McNamara will spike it with three seconds to go in the first half. It's a good throw by McNamara, deep out, kind of floating away from it, too. A great catch by Ronnie Bell. Two plays in, and Kate McNamara is taking two big hits. But standing in there and wisely getting up to the line of scrimmage. Clock stops on a first down, spiking it and giving a chance for a long field goal. The Groza Award winner from last season, best kicker in America. And UConn's going to call a timeout before a 62-yard field goal attempt for Jake Moody. His career long's 52, as he tied it against Washington last year. So this by 10 yards would be his career long. Get a look at Jay Harbaugh, the son of Jim, special teams coordinator. And he's likely telling his guys, hey, look, after this ball is kicked 
you have to cover. You have to cover this field goal. Because if I'm UConn, you're putting a returner back deep. And we've seen famously a number of times on these long field goal attempts, they go short. And because you have so many linemen and tight ends on the field, it's a great time to return. And UConn will indeed send a returner back. Jay Harbaugh likely reminding his crew, you have to cover. And for what that means for those linemen is as soon as the ball is kicked, Holder yells away, 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 and they spread out. Trying to get down and cover. So this would be an all-time Michigan record for longest field goal made if Moody's able to knock it through. But Rosa is under the goalposts to see if he comes up short. And this is going to be returnable. He will come up short. Rosa's going to run it out. Rosa to the 20-yard line. And knocked out of bounds. So it won't be a kick six. But it will be a 38 to nothing Michigan lead at halftime. When we come back, Kevin Nagandi and Booger McFarland, they'll have the State Farm halftime report for you after these messages and a word from our ABC stations. If you know. Welcome back to ESPN College Football presented by Arby's. We're in Michigan, and this is the Big Ten on ABC. Just about set for the start of the third quarter, and it's all Michigan, 38-0, as they dominate the first half against UConn. And the one-two punch of J.J. McCarthy and Blake Corum doing work in the first half. McCarthy looks like he's probably done for the day, 10 of 13, 172 yards, certainly making plays on the run. And showing why Jim Harbaugh made him the starting quarterback. And then Blake Corum. Four rushing touchdowns in the first half. His career high. And as we take a look at today's player spotlight brought to you by Champion. Blake Corum certainly deserves to be in that spotlight. As his first half was a record setter. Tied for the most rushing touchdowns and a half in program history for Michigan. So Bob Shoes in here with Roddy Jones. Chris Budden will join us from down on the field in just a moment. And Roddy, you know, you talked about it from the film that you watched of McCarthy coming into this game. You understood why Jim Harbaugh did what he did and made the decision that he made. Certainly seemed to be backed up in the first 30 minutes of this game. It was. He was efficient. He was accurate. He made some wild plays. We've seen him with his legs. Everything that we've seen so far today, I think, and last week, has been a snapshot of what these coaches have seen over and over and over, really the last two years, from J.J. McCarthy. But managing moments like this are almost as important as managing big moments when you've got a big-time opponent. Being, Making sure that you're not overlooking a team like UConn, you can still go out and be efficient and successful despite having the lack of competition on the other side. And as we talked about yesterday, and I think it's something that Jim Harbaugh told us when he said, look, it's a meritocracy. And I, if you make a decision where the players can tell who deserves the position more and you go the other way, what message does that send to the rest of the team? So doesn't seem to be any doubt that he's made the right call having J.J. McCarthy take over. And if this was a battle at defensive end, it'd be a meritocracy. For that to extend to the most important position, I think shows the values of this program. Let's head down to Chris Budden. Bob talked with Jim Harbaugh going into halftime. Very pleased in all three phases of the game, the way that J.J. McCarthy has handled the offense, the three and outs on defense. What he wanted to talk about most, though, was special teams. He said, I knew coming into today, A.J. Henning was going to have a big game. He goes, I told it to the team yesterday at the 61-yard punt return for a touchdown. And how about this? He becomes just the fourth player in Michigan history to have a career kick return for a touchdown and a punt return for a touchdown. Well, UConn will start with the football after putting up only 64 yards of total offense in the first half. And Nathan Carter is fighting through some type of an injury as Zion Turner on a keeper gets down the sideline. And he gets across the 40 and out to the 43-yard line, picks up 19 yards. Depth at quarterback probably affects this some, but we haven't seen enough of that today. Zion Turner's running ability, Michigan keyed on the running back. Zion Turner pulls in or gets around the corner for a big game. One of the best plays of the day. That's the longest play from scrimmage offensively for UConn. A 
toss to Victor Rosa, the freshman. Finds a cutback lane, gets across midfield. He's got eight more. Victor Rosa. What can still be accomplished in this game for Utah? I think establishing, number one, fight. I mean, it, it has to be ingrained in your program that you're going to fight for four quarters, especially early on in Jim Morris' tenure. Establishing that no matter what the scoreboard says, you're going to continue to fight. But two, I mean, you're going to get the opportunity to continue to get reps. And if they're going to win this year, that offensive line has to be a big part of it. Two good runs early on. Rosa again. Short of the first down. It'll be third down and one. The other thing, Bob, is scenarios, third and short execution. How do your, how does your operation work? How does your quarterback manage it, decision-making? Because you have a true freshman quarterback. Every single rep is crucial for his development. And so not taking these types of situations as, hey, we're down big in the big house, taking it as, hey, let's treat it like it's 0-0, zero, zero, and we're going to go out and execute. And it doesn't get much easier for UConn and Nick Charlton call and plays next week as they'll go on the road to NC State. Flags down at the snap of this play. False start. Offense number 67. Five yard penalty. Third down. The next UFC fight night is tonight for the Apex in Las Vegas with a phantom weight main event. 14 and 4. Corey Sandhagen will square off against 24 year old rising star Song Yadong. The prelims start at 4 Eastern, 1 Pacific, followed by the main card at 7 Eastern, 4 Pacific on ESPN. Plus. To get it, go to ESPNplus.com or download the ESPN app. So now it's third down at 6 after the penalty. Another handoff to Rosa up the middle, and he's got the first down. Right into the heart of the Michigan defense. He got seven. Oh, it's good push by that UConn offensive line. Mazzy Smith there in the middle kind of slips to, on the back side to create a big hole. UConn starting to build something in the second half. There's just still a bunch of starters out for Michigan, so it's not like they've had wholesale changes on the defense. That type of momentum is something that you can build off of and show your team. And Michigan just trying to get lined up on defense here. And Rosa takes advantage. And this is the deepest that UConn's been able to move the ball so far today. It's the first time they're inside Michigan's 43-yard line. And some of this stuff's going to frustrate Jim Harbaugh, not getting the call in early enough. Michigan's a defensive line where they like to send certain players to the strength of the, certain, the formation, certain players to the weakness, and Jesse Minter, first-year offensive coordinator, or defensive coordinator here at Michigan, will be frustrated with that sequence. And there's big number 58, Mazzie Smith. He's the only returning defender to start every game last year. For Michigan and of course they lose that big one-two punch and now the reverse is a fumble in the backfield and Dejon Harrison the messed up exchange with Victor Rosa Harrison has to cover it up it's a loss of 10. Victor Rosa one of the backups at running backs you just wonder how many times has he repped this is this something a package that's in there for him look like the timing off on that one so I think they'd have had some room on the other side if they'd have been able to, to link up but Frustrating play after some good momentum early in the drive. And it's Victor Rosa, the true freshman, still in a running back. Again, it has been piecemeal work for Nate Carter in today's game as he was dinged in the first half with an undisclosed injury. Here's a shot down the sideline for Zion Turner. Incomplete. Tried to squeeze it into Clercius. DJ Turner again forced Clercius right up against the sideline. Michigan showed man-to-man -man coverage early. DJ Turner does a nice job of just edging the receiver towards the sideline. You know, in practice, they paint these red lines on the field that are about five yards from the sideline. You're taught to hold the red line, press back into that defensive back. DJ Turner eliminates the window to throw the ball by pressing him out towards the sideline. So Carrington to punt for the seventh time. He's had one blocked and one returned for a touchdown, and that one was almost blocked. Takes a sideways hop. And will roll down just inside the Michigan 18-yard line. Nice day to sit outside in Ann Arbor near the cube. Enjoy two.
Welcome back to the Big House. Michigan up 38 to nothing. We saw Cade McNamara come in before halftime. He took a couple hits where he was slow to get up, particularly on the second hit that he took. He is not out here with the team right now. I've confirmed that he is in the locker room with the trainers and undisclosed injury. As soon as I get more information or we see him out here, I will let you guys know. Well, that'll put J.J. McCarthy back in the game, which actually surprises me a bit. At 38 to nothing, he's got Blake Corum in the backfield. So the starters pretty much in totality back on the field to open up the third quarter offensively for Michigan. Although despite the score, and Roddy, this is a point you made, there is value in going in, experiencing halftime, talking to the coaches, coming back out, kind of working up a sweat again, maybe getting a series or two or three in and dealing with that change over the way you're going to have to in the Big Ten season when it arrives next week. Yeah, from an adjustment standpoint, I think it helps you. It also helps from a conditioning standpoint, having to shut it down and then ramp back up, as you said. Corum. First down. Picked up 11. Part of the, the toughest thing early in the year when you get into some of these fights when you haven't been in them when you're having to go into the fourth quarter just the overall feeling of being locked in mentally for that long something that you have to get used to you don't do it in scrimmages and so until you do it in a game you don't really get in the flow of it even if you played some ball but especially when you have a quarterback that's not accustomed to doing it this time McNamara gives it to CJ Stokes and he gets a yard at the 31 yard line another tackle for Jackson Mitchell Jackson Mitchell talk about a tough kid playing with a screw in his navicular bone which I believe is in his foot <laughs> he was actually according to the coaches told by some doctors might not be the best idea to play but he said no way I am the heart and soul guy of this defense he braces it every week and plays just about every defensive snap. He's the heart of this crew. When you have a leader that's willing to put his body on the line like that, it really inspires all defense, and he's played well this year. McCarthy over the middle, and a catch made for a gain of about four to Eric All. There's another tackle for Jackson Mitchell. And how about the game day story today with Eric All? Back in 2001, as a baby, saved from a house fire by two firefighters, was not breathing. They basically said he was dead when they pulled him as a baby out of the house fire, but he was revived, and the firefighter that saved him, named Tom Broyles, met him this year for the first time since then. They were reunited. An incredible story, and a guy who is going to play at the next level. He's one of the best tight ends in the country. But a great story. McCarthy to the sideline, right at the first down line to game. It's hauled in by Ronnie Bell. His momentum took him back, but it looks like he stepped out right at the 40-yard line for a first down. Watch Blake Corum in protection. Okay, Mac, excuse me, JJ McCarthy actually bails from the pocket a little early there, but when you make a completion like that, all as well that ends well, but nice job in pass protection by Blake Corum. If you didn't see the Gene Wojciechowski piece on Eric All earlier today, go find it's it. It's worth checking out. <laughs> it's Absolutely. worth watching. And it was just tremendous storytelling and an amazing story. McCarthy swings one out to Roman Wilson. Wilson with speed. He has that extra gear. Tripped up by Chris Sheeran. And that might have been the last man between he and Roman Wilson in the end zone. It's really good blocking on the perimeter. These wide receivers have done a great job all day on the perimeter. That was Cornelius Johnson. And it's a good decision by J.J. McCarthy. That's a decision that's based on numbers. So you count the guys in the box and the number of guys that you have outside to defend that little, that little bubble screen goes to Roman Wilson. When you've got a talent like that with the speed that Wilson has, Anytime he can get in his hands is a good play. Heading in motion. He takes the jet sweep handoff. Inside for four. Another tackle for Jackson Mitchell. 
Well, it's got to be really exciting for Michigan fans, as I think we've only seen a fraction of what Michigan's going to throw out this year. They've got four really talented tight ends that can all split out. At some point this year, all four of those guys are going to be on the field together. When you have Donovan Edwards back, putting he and A.J. Henning on the field together, do you consider them receivers, running backs? They can play both. It's a lot of toys for Sharon Moore and Matt Weiss. Straight ahead handoff to C.J. Stokes. And that looks to be good for another Michigan first down. With Sharon Moore, the co-offensive coordinator and offensive line coach. Also, kind of play caller. I mean, Michigan has been very, very vague about how the plays are called and who's calling them between he and Matt Weiss, but it has certainly worked. They did mark Stokes down about a half yard shy and Sequoia McDuffie is down and injured for UConn. So we'll step aside. At your February 13th, 2001 was the day of the fire. Paul came in as a working structure fire, possible entrapment of a child. It was just like a black crown and colored the sky. I'm just sitting there thinking, there's no way he's going to be able to survive this. I had to find that kid. Probably a matter of minutes or even seconds, I would have been gone. I just think, what if? That's just a little snippet of the story of Eric All as a baby in a house fire. Blasting up the middle, Isaiah Gash on third down, picks up the first down. Saved by Tom Broyles, an EMT named Sean Venus. And you can see him in the blue jacket carrying all onto a stretcher. Immediately started to give him mouth to mouth and heard just a little bit of a cry, a little bit of a whimper and a gasp of breath and knew when they got him in the ambulance that they basically taken him from dead to alive. And it highlights what our first responders do every single day. We don't often get the follow-up stories of where the people that are saved by our firemen and EMTs end up. So not only is it a great story about Eric All, but also about our first responders and what they do on a daily basis. Ronnie Bell scoops one up from McCarthy down to the 11-yard line again at 12. J.J. McCarthy just back to work. This He's able to get that throw up a little bit, then Bell may have a chance to get in the end zone, but still able to get a completion. And this has been a very methodical drive for Michigan. It's been a very mature drive by this offense, just consistently getting small chunks of yardage. 11th play of the drive. Corum. Gonna have to take his offensive line out for uh, probably a couple dinners this week for what they've opened up for him this year. 12 carries, and seven of the 12 didn't go for a touchdown. <laughs> Five did, and have so far, and that ties a Michigan program record for most rushing touchdowns in a single game. I don't know what's five out of. 12 is, but it's pretty close to 50% of his carries getting in the end zone. How do Welcome, Kevin, back in studio. We got an upset brewing in Bloomington here. Indiana seven point favorites. How about the Hilltoppers of Western Kentucky, bud? Fake it left, fake it right, come back across the middle. Nice play design, Kev. Austin Reed, the quarterback, finding Josh. Simon and then Reed going in with the keeper and oh look at Lane all oh, dapper. No Lane on the suit like that. Old <laughs> Miss coming up against Georgia Tech. That's our second game. Back to you, Bob, Roddy, and Chris. All right, I'm alongside a possibly very interested party in the game that comes up after ours is done. Very interested. Those very jackets, the rec got a chance in that game. You give him a puncher's chance? I give him a, I give him a puncher's chance. Yeah, defense has <laughs> played well this year. That's what I like to hear. Well, let's take a look 
And honoring those who serve, brought to you by Navy Federal Credit Union, and our chance to say thanks to Larry Hilliard, who was the father of UConn defensive backs coach Dalton Hilliard. Larry Hilliard, a Marine Corps veteran, and his wife, Amalia, most recently stationed in Hawaii again. We honor those who serve, brought to you by Navy Federal Credit Union. Dalton Hilliard, the defensive backs coach. Obviously proud of his parents. Thank you for all of those. Thank you to all of those who have served our country and at the Eric All Story. Thank you to everybody. The first responders, people who go out and do the dirty work every day. There's a check down to Burns in the left flat. And he gets stood up and ridden out of bounds. Colson with the stop after a gain of about five. Yeah, we always need to make sure that we talk and honor every year about those that run towards danger. Right. Those that run towards it when everybody else is running away. People that, that are the backbone of this country, man. And off to Rosa. Two yards shy of the first down. And again, Derek Moore in the middle of that pile for Michigan. Still a decent number of starters out there for Michigan. Chris Jenkins still out there. Mozzie Smith as well. Mason Graham. And we were told that the starters would likely play a little bit longer than we expected today as Michigan starting to gear up with their Big Ten opener next week against Maryland. Fourth down. Rosa brought down behind the line. A loss of a yard. Kari Page came through along with Jalen Harrell. Had the defensive line slanting, and Jalen Harrell comes right through. He's been one of the really nice surprises early in this season. He knew he was talented, but playing that Sam linebacker spot up on the line of scrimmage a lot for this Michigan team. He's done a nice job early in this season. Makes a big play there. Now DJ Turner gets a chance to return a kick for Michigan. As Carrington has been busy, the punter for the Huskies. AJ Henning, of course, the first half punt return for a touchdown. And this one returnable for Turner. Out of the wash. Nope. He gets bottled up and brought down after a four-yard return. <laughs> Well, for the UConn Huskies, uh, there have been brighter days, obviously. This is a team that, when they were wrapping up their stint in the Big East, went to four straight bowls, including a New Year's Six Bowl. But nine straight losing seasons since, only one bowl appearance. Of course, they became independent during COVID after not participating that season. And Jim Mora hired as the head coach. And you wonder with numbers like this, Roddy, going forward, what the possible future for UConn football is. As Davis Warren takes over a quarterback now for Michigan and squeezes one in over the middle. It's a five-yard game. Let's see on a Chris with more on now the sideline being patrolled, Chris, by Jim Moore. You know, the scenery may change, but the pregame traditions don't. All the time when he was at UCLA, I would see him running the stairs at the Rose Bowl, and he still has the same tradition now. He came out today, he'll run four laps around the field, and then he'll run 20 times up and down the stairs. He has taken part of the pregame workout out. He used to do a couple 110 sprints down the sidelines, but says, I don't want to pop an Achilles at my age. That would not be good. <laughs> Uh, when, when, when he said that to us as a coach, if I was going to take anything out, not to pop an Achilles, it'd be the stadiums of the big house. But no, Jim Mora said he likes the challenge of going uphill. He likes doing hard things. He's an avid mountain climber, hiker. And this mission, this uh, UConn program is certainly going to be an uphill battle. As, as you mentioned, Bob, this is a, a team that has been on really hard times here recently. The walk-on quarterback, Davis Warren, hands off to Isaiah Gash, picks up the first down. And Jim Moore is a guy that's taken over projects, rebuilding projects previously. I mean, when he was at UCLA, that was a program that was 10 games under 500 in the years before he took over. 
16 games over 500 in his tenure there at UCLA, so had to rebuild it. Now, UCLA, one of the big brands in college football, obviously is ref as seen by the realignment, so UConn a little bit different. But he, if there's anybody that's going to embrace the challenge, certainly Jim Moore. Stokes to midfield. And I wonder about that challenge. Yeah. With all of the crazy conference realignment we see all the time, and there was more of it this year in college football, who's to say that at some point UConn as a program may go a different direction? But they seemed to make a philosophical lean towards basketball, yep. saying, you know what, we'll stay independent in football, even if that is to the detriment of our football program. Our priority is basketball and getting back in the Big East. The current Big East to those old basketball rivalries, what does that mean for the future of their football program? As getting spun down as Alex Orji, the fourth string quarterback, came to take a snap. You know, it, it's a great question because as we looked towards Notre Dame specifically with all the realignment being an independent, we haven't really talked much about the other independents, UConn being one of those in football. What happens to them down the line as these conferences get bigger? And it's a tough landscape to navigate if that is the world you're living in as an independent. Well, Hail to the victors. You're going to hear that a lot probably down the road in this one. We're back after a word from our ABC stations. Well, it's time to get your fours up as we head to the fourth quarter. And I have to tell you, as a 47-point underdog and down by 45, a lot of effort by that UConn fan to get ready for today's game. I respect it. I do, too. <laughs> it's a lot of paint to wash off and a sad shower later on. Third down to start the fourth quarter. Isaiah Gash moves the pile for a Michigan first down. And these are the, the, the parts of games that you really appreciate, not only as a, as a backup, a guy that's not necessarily going to get in on a regular basis once Big Ten play starts, but also as a starter because these guys work so hard and you get to see them have some success. J.J. McCarthy you now talking to Davis Warren as we're going to see a, a few different quarterbacks rotate through there now. Alex Orji now back in the game and he throws a swing pass out to the edge. Brought in by Tavier Dunlap. Coming up on 6 Eastern. 3 Pacific over on ESPN. Brian Kelly and the LSU Tigers taking on Mississippi State. That's the first half of a twi-night doubleheader of SEC football on ESPN because at 9 Eastern, Miami, Texas A&M will get underway in College Station. Both games are also available on the ESPN app. How about the decision by Jimbo Fisher to go to Max Johnson this week? Benching Haynes King before they take on Miami. Orgy on the keeper with a flat bit. Personal foul, illegal block below the waist. Defense, number seven. Mm. Half the distance to the goal from the end of the run, first down. So that will be a 16-yard run, and then a personal foul tacked on as Max Johnson last season at LSU. Now, he'll take over at Texas A&M. Yeah, he will. And, and uh, Haynes King missed too many receivers a week ago. There's some talent outside, although Fixing the core, changing the quarterback position isn't going to fix Texas A&M on offense. They need to be better on the offensive line. The running backs need to be better in pass protection. The receivers need to be better creating separation. We'll see if Max Johnson gives them a spark. Now Andy Maddox gets a chance to take a snap at quarterback. Hands one to C.J. Stokes. Stokes turned back at the 10-yard line. There is still a segment of our viewership that's very closely dialed into what may or may not happen on this drive. Maybe tuned into every <laughs> Michigan drive from here on. Well, it's very important. Davis Warren gets a chance to rotate back in. Now it is just the quarterback carousel yes, it is. being employed by Jim Harbaugh. Different quarterback, it seems, every snap. 
It's an all-out blitz coming from UConn. There's a slant thrown low, incomplete. Try to squeeze one into Cornelius Johnson. I thought Davis Warren cut that loose a little quick. It was the old double slants on the outside. You get the inside receiver running a corner route to the back pylon. I thought he might have had that if he waited just a second. A little bit of pressure in his face as well. But Jim Harbaugh made a point to tell us that Davis Warren's got a pretty good arm, especially for a guy who walked on. And a timeout called defensively by UConn. Charge timeout. So we'll step aside for just a half. moment. College football on ABC is presented by Arby's. Arby's, we have the means. Very unique look from the SoCon Paracommandos as they parachuted into Michigan Stadium before today's game to deliver the game ball. And they were honored in the end zone earlier in the half. It looks like it'd be so cool to do. So yeah. much fun. I'll never do it. Or scary. Yes. Third down and goal after the timeout. And it is Alex Orgy in at quarterback. He's got Isaiah Gash to his left. empties the backfield quarterback keeper orgy breaks a tackle touchdown and michigan continues to pour it on all six michigan touchdowns on the ground and the first player to score other than blake corum congratulations alex orgy you can see the talent that he possesses with his feet and he's one-on-one -on -one with a linebacker at the line of scrimmage makes a miss and then there's no shot michigan just emptying the backfield to get him in the end zone that's his second rushing touchdown of the season and moody makes it 52 to nothing alex orgy showing you the special legs to extend the lead Attention. Extra Yard for Teachers Week is an annual back to school effort led by the College Football Playoff Foundation that brings college sports together to recognize and show appreciation to great teachers across the country. To support Extra Yard for Teachers recognition and resources initiatives, follow at CFP Extra Yard or scan the QR code. For more, let's go down to Chris Butt. Bob Yukon assistant coach John Allen and Jr.'s parents, John Allen Sr., picture with his son and Wanda were both teachers. Dad's now retired, was a physical education teacher, as well as a football and track coach at Meadowbrook High School in North Chesterfield, Virginia. Wanda, mom, was a special needs teacher at Matoaka High School in Chesterfield, Virginia. Extra Yard for Teachers is always a chance for us to say thank you to folks out there that have chosen to do a much more productive <laughs> thing with their lives than we have chosen to do. <laughs> so we go back to Kevin too. Gandhi. The number four team in complete control. So is the number one team in the country. Bob on ESPN. Georgia rolling 45 nothing against South Carolina. Pretty good one on ESPN, too. Purdue just scored, so they're up 15 to 10 against the Qs. Uh, right now, Cincinnati in control. Virginia up a touchdown against Old Dominion on the ACC network. And reminding our audience, we're less than 40 minutes away from watching USC transfer Jackson Dart. Ole Miss taking on Georgia Tech. Back to you. Can the Ramblin' Wreck hang in there and maybe pull off an upset? Adi Jones. You know, the, the defense of Georgia Tech was good against Clemson week one. That Ole Miss offense hasn't found its stride yet. They only scored 28 points against Troy. So I, I think the Jackets can make it close. A roll out here for Zion Turner. And he'll run to the sideline and run out of bounds. Chased out by McGregor. Zion Last Turner. season, we had a chance to call Georgia Tech at Clemson. And that was one of the gutsiest slugfest type games 
that we called all season. Georgia Tech fought tooth and nail to stay in that game. So there, there's a toughness, a grittiness, kind of a sandpaper about that team. There is. Clemson wasn't the offense that uh, wasn't a very good offense last year, but but you're right. It's a team that fought down the stretch. And offensively, I think they've made strides with Jeff Sims at quarterback, but it's a tall task against a very talented Ole Miss team. Victor Rosa piled up after a gain of a couple. Again, Braden McGregor right in the middle of that pile to make the stop for Michigan. Big question for Michigan going forward is what's the ceiling for this Michigan team? Can they contend for a national championship? Can they contend for a Big Ten title? And from what we've seen so far, Bob, I think this is absolutely a team that can contend in the Big Ten. I think they are as good as any team in the Big Ten and or better than every team in the Big Ten, maybe other than Ohio State. The question this year, I think, is can anybody beat Georgia? Because in their games against Oregon and South Carolina, Georgia is now uh, scored 94 points so far and only allowed three. So Georgia looks to be just unstoppable. But Michigan should be in the conversation all year long. Hey, John Harrison on that end around just short of a first down. So UConn tries to get lined up to quarterback sneak it. I'm not sure they were set. And as a result, the timeout was called. charge timeout, Michigan. Michigan They're got first. the timeout call. So we will come right back to the big house in a moment. The new iPhone. We return with a look at this week's AP College Football Rankings brought to you by Allstate. None of the teams that are in the top ten being challenged right now. And truthfully, Roddy, is take a look at the teams that have yet to kick off. And we'll kick off later on this afternoon and tonight. I don't know that anyone in the top 10 is going to be challenged today. I think SC Fresno, if, if USC doesn't come out and play well, that defense is going to be tested today with Fresno State, Jake Hayner. So USC should take care of business, but they don't play well. They'll be tested. Fourth down and a foot after the Michigan timeout. Kale Millen is back in at quarterback. And the look over with the play clock at 15, so plenty of time. It's been all run with Kale Millen so far. And he'll run the option, it looks like. Hold on and get thrown for a loss. And it is a turnover on downs as Michigan will take it back. Michigan's defense not yielding anything. It's been all dominant for the Wolverines today. Last November, it was finally Michigan's turn. And the big one with Ohio State, Hassan Haskins, 28 carries, 169 rushing yards, five touchdowns. One of three Michigan running backs that's now done that in a single game. Blake Corum tying that record today in Michigan. The first time under Jim Harbaugh, they come out on top of Ohio State, 42 to 27. And everything that Jim Harbaugh gave back pre-COVID, he basically got back after that win. Alan Bowman in the game now at quarterback, and he'll hand one off to C.J. Stokes. There were NFL rumors again regarding Jim Harbaugh off of last season, and here he is still in Michigan, and his salary has returned to the lofty heights it was once at. Yeah, and I know Michigan fans were a little uneasy with where the program was going. Would they ever get over the hump? But sometimes it just takes time to get all the pieces the right way. And we don't like to have a lot of patience nowadays in college football. But it's amazing what one win can do over the right team. Andy Maddox hits Amorian Walker. And now Alan Bowman will run back in and play quarterback. So the quarterback shuffle continues for the Wolverines. And a lot of slaps on the head for Maddox for that completion. Of course, this is now J.J. McCarthy's team, and he'll be back out there for the Big Ten opener next week against Maryland. Isaiah Gash picks up the first down. And Hassan Haskins with five touchdowns against Ohio State last year. Blake Corum, five touchdowns in today's game against UConn. He had four in the first half. It's been an impressive performance, and, and he's his five touchdowns are really really just a microcosm of how efficient this offense has been. The offensive line has been fantastic as they've gotten in the low red zone. And this offense has just been methodical. Substitution offense, 12 men, five-yard penalty. 
Third down. Well, with the kind of bodies that right now Michigan is shuffling in and out of the game personnel wise to give all these players a chance to play probably not surprising that they had one extra in the huddle for a moment. A little confusing especially with the quarterback switching out as much as they are. Now it's Alan Bowman. will take the snap and give it to Leon Franklin. He picks up two. For those who have followed college football and are wondering where have I heard that name Alan Bowman before started for Texas Tech for a couple of years very famously had a partially collapsed lung after a game against West Virginia a few years ago played a lot of ball down at Texas Tech and he's the fourth stringer maybe the fifth stringer here for for Michigan that's the kind of depth they have at quarterback. again breaking tackles and fights his way to the 20-yard line you know one other thing that bears mentioning about Blake Corum not only five touchdowns on the ground today but exactly the kind of example setter that you want in your program he uses a lot of his NIL earnings to give back he's got some NIL money coming in he bought a hundred turkeys last year for Thanksgiving to give away he buys Christmas gifts in concert with the Detroit PAL he holds an annual charity football camp for kids, a free football camp to come and spend the day on his own dime. As Bowman climbs the pocket, dumps one off. Getting to the sideline, Franklin reaches it out. Is he in? He is. Another Michigan touchdown. Boys of Alan Bowman on that play does he stay in bounds it looks like that foot does stay in bounds question is does the knee hit before he gets in the end zone I think the hand plants the right knee certainly He's good that's yep. a touchdown touchdown and the absolute Domination continues for Michigan. Even the backup kicker Tommy Dolman gets a chance to come in and try a point after. And he knocks it right down the middle. 59 to nothing. Michigan on top of UConn. Let's check in again with Kevin Nagandi. Well, let's go back to Syracuse and Boog. A dramatic turn of events here. First, it's the offense for the Schrader. Orange. Garrett Schrader to Ronda Gadsden. Yeah, great job of him keeping the play alive. And then look at number 82 throwing a block there out front. And the Q's getting it in the end zone. Uh, they get the two-point conversion. Here comes Purdue. And oh, no, Purdue. Aiden O'Connell, oh, no, got time. And don't do that. Yeah, you ever been in a situation where you panic? Uh, <laughs> plenty of times. Just like O'Connell there. <laughs> Caleb Okachukwu with the pitch. Nice job pitch. there. Syracuse up by nine. Jeff Collins, he needs a signature win. Well, first of all, he just finished working out, and this would be a great win for him to get today. Georgia Tech taking on Ole Miss. Good luck, Ronnie, today. Back to you, Bob. Appreciate that, Kevin. Appreciate <laughs> They're pulling that. for you. Uh, I, I, you know what? I, I, I do appreciate it. Jeff Collins certainly could use a signature win. This is a Georgia Tech team. It's got one of the hardest non-conference schedules in the country. They go to UCF next week. They go to Pitt week after that. We want to catch Ole Miss before that offense gets rolling. Well, UConn lost a lopsided game to Syracuse last week and back to the Orange for a moment. And that was a team that Jim Mora told us when we were talking to him this week. He thinks they're sneaky good. And that's a team, obviously, you know a lot about. Yeah, they're, they're, they're playing a very good Purdue team that just took Penn State to the wire. But Syracuse defensively has been one of the more underrated units in the entire country. Tony White's done a great job with that crew. They shut down UConn in that game that they played a lot of talent. And if they're able to win this game against Purdue, I think it's a not only a big win for Dino Babers in Syracuse, one winning season for Dino Babers since he took over, but it's a big win for the ACC that struggled so mightily in non-conference against Power Fives last year. Kel Millen back in at quarterback. As UConn just trying to get on the scoreboard before the game's over with eight minutes to go. And Victor Rosa. 
Picks up a yard. Now, Nathan Carter, we saw unspecified injury, but did not look like himself in the first half. He did come back in and gave it a go, carried the ball a handful of times. But you have to think at this point, you've got NC State on the road next week. And then a bunch of games that look a lot more winnable for UConn once you get past next week in the second half of their season. And you have to think that right now they're trying to make sure that Nathan Carter's going to be as healthy as he can be for those games because he has not played much in today's game. No, he, he is not. After that first drive, it's just kind of been in and out. But look at the defenses that they play during this stretch. Syracuse just talked about how good that defense is. Michigan's going to be one of the best defenses in the country when it's all said and done. And NC State, a defense with 10 starters returning from a nine-win team a year ago, going down to Raleigh, Carter Finley, another hostile environment. And even Fresno, that's not a, that's not a walk in the park against that crew either. Third down and nine. No one to throw. And that's broken up. Tried to squeeze one in. And it was knocked away from Ethan Williams. We were just a little bit late from Kale Millen. Looked like he wanted to see it before he let it go. By the time it got out there. Good coverage from Keyshawn Harris. Yeah, Harris had the coverage. Jake Thaw, third different player today that has had a chance to return a punt for Michigan. And he'll call for a fair catch. At the 36-yard line of the Wolverines. Well, coming up at 6 Eastern, 3 Pacific, over on ESPN, LSU will host Mississippi State in Death Valley. And that will be followed by Miami heading to College Station to take on number 24, Texas A&M. Both games available on the ESPN app. Quarterback for Miami, Tyler Van Dyke going into Kyle Field. The big time NFL prospect since week eight of last season, just how good he has been. 331 yards per game. Ended last year with six straight games, 300 yards, passing and three passing touchdowns. Danny Hughes takes the handoff. And yet another quarterback gets in the game. This is Jaden Denigal for Michigan. How many quarterbacks did you see warming up for Michigan before the game, Bob? There were six centers practicing quarterback exchanges for Michigan, and they ran out of centers. <laughs> they actually had a couple of trainers kind of going side saddle and snapping to three extra quarterbacks. There were nine quarterbacks on the field for Michigan taking pregame snaps. And you know what? By the time we play the next six and a half minutes, even though we kind of mocked a little bit of a over usage of quarterbacks right. in the pregame. All nine might get in there. We you never know. We might see all of them. We might see all of them. We've seen the majority. That's for sure. And and the, the reason that you do it, I don't think it's it's worth stating again. Like, these are memories for these guys. You may never have another opportunity to play in the big house. You may never have another opportunity to go out on the field in meaningful ball and put on that uniform. No matter how long, how much you have more in your career. So... It is cool, but when you have 140 guys on the team, I guess nine centers, that ratio, that ratio plays out. Well, the, at this point, mixture of backups that are out there, a little bit of a stumble on the exchange. So with 540 to go in the fourth quarter, Michigan will kick it away, and they'll let Tommy Doman go in. He just connected on a point after for the last Michigan touchdown, and now he'll have a chance to punt for the first time. Pretty good kick. Rosa, fair catch, down to the 16-yard line. Let's go down to Chris Button. Bob, a pretty unique story. Mimi Bolden Morris, a grad assistant for Michigan, is the first female grad assistant in the Big Ten. She's the sister of defensive end Mike Morris. She recently graduated and finished up her hoops career at Georgetown. 
really, we were watching her pregame. She can throw it better than Roddy can. She can rip it. <laughs> That's not it's true. true. <laughs> it's true. It is true. Yeah. I don't know if she, she needed to point it. that out. I know. Her dad was a high school coach, coached his brother. She was the water girl on the team and has always wanted to be around football. In fact, at Georgetown, she was offered a grad assistant job to be with Hoops, and she was like, no, no, no. I want to be with my brother. I don't want to be on the football field. And Jim Harbaugh actually said that whenever she would come to visit her brother, Mike, not only as a basketball star, she had that sport to talk about with Coach Harbaugh, but she's just addicted to football. And on uh, this quarterback keeper, Millen tries to run to the sideline. He's got nowhere to go. So obviously, it's in the bloodlines to be a really good athlete in this family, but also, Jim Harbaugh said, you, know, you just talk to her, and the wheels are turning. She could make us better. She's just got a really smart, analytical mind and I think she could help our coaching staff. And so they brought her in as a GA to help work with the quarterbacks and be on the offensive side. I love that thought process from Jim Harbaugh. Number one, making your organization better, regardless of the gender of the person that, that can do that. But number two, I mean, so often we see men coaching in women's sports and sports that they never played. But when a woman wants to coach a man's sport, we often get, well, you didn't play that. Doesn't matter if you have a mind for the game and you can make the organization better, you deserve a spot. And so I love Jim Harbaugh thinking outside the box to make his organization better. Coming up on four minutes to go as UConn tries to keep this drive alive, third down and six. Hale Millen. Up the sideline, under throws Robert Burns on a little wheel route as he would have had the first down if Millen had elevated that pass and put it on him. So it will be fourth and six with 3.56 remaining. You see, the, the, the result isn't going the way UConn would have hoped. But they're going to look back at this film and see so many opportunities where the plays are there and you just have to make them, whether it's catching a football on a third down, making a throw on a third down, little things where Michigan didn't beat you on that play. You beat yourself. Aritan to punt again. And Thaw looking for a return. Catches this one in traffic and goes down. Well, you mentioned, at least Chris Budden did, taking an unnecessary shot, I think, at yeah. Roddy Jones, that Mimi Bolden Morris could throw the football. And we have video proof that she could spin it. Slinging it. I mean, those were <laughs> those are 20-yard throws from the hash to the sideline that she was just putting on the money consistently. It's impressive. Right? For a second there, it was like, hey, suit her up. She may get a rep today. Brandon Mann now in the game at quarterback for Michigan. Every Donahue picks up about four and a half. I think we're up to, what, 12 different players to carry the ball on the ground for Michigan in this game. Donahue's the 12th. And yet it feels like Blake Corum had basically a monopoly on touchdowns today with his name <laughs> scoring five so far today. Danny Hughes. Danny Hughes. He gets a chunk carry. Down to the UConn 36 with 3.10 to go. Fifty points in its first three games for the first time in program history. This is a this is a program that's been playing football for a long time. So anytime you can pull out a first in program history, it's a special accomplishment. That's Damon Brinson who was down for UConn. Well, obviously, this is a soft landing spot for Michigan to start off the season when you've got Colorado State, Hawaii, and UConn. Uh, they didn't sign up for any of these big mega early season matchups, so they will first be tested once they get to the Big Ten season. But Maryland, Iowa, Indiana, those are their first three Big Ten games. Now, you don't take any game of the Big Ten for granted, but it's really by the time you get to the Penn State, Michigan State portion of the schedule that 
you start to wonder, can they stay perfect? And obviously they will close the year Thanksgiving weekend at the Horseshoe against Ohio State. And you saw it on that graphic. There's only one game this season where ESPN's FBI gives them less than a 68% chance. All start, offense number 66, five-yard penalty, first down. One game where they have less than a 68% chance to win the game right now. Those two games you reference against Penn State, Michigan State, are here at the big house. Only trips on the road is for them in, in Big Ten play. At Iowa, at Indiana, at Rutgers, and at Ohio State. So it looks like this Michigan team set up for an undefeated showdown potentially with Ohio State at the end of the year. Brandon Mann swings one. Brandon Mann pass. The Darius Clemens. And this is the complete look at the Michigan schedule. So again, Maryland at home, back-to-back -back road games against Iowa and Indiana. But then the ranked opponents arrive. That's Penn State and Michigan State in back-to-back -back games here at the Big House. And some of it's the, the, the overall setup of the divisions in the Big Ten. Although, I think at the end of this year, the Big Ten's going to look up and say... We need to think about going to a situation where the best two teams play in the championship game because Ohio State and Michigan are the clear best two teams. And if you could have them play in the championship game, it would give you a better opportunity to get two teams potentially in the college football playoff. And why have two divisions? Exactly. Why not just have one big old conference and rotate the schedules as best you can? Because if you don't give the division champion on the other side a trip to the championship game, then What's the point of divisions? What are they playing for? Yeah, well, the the overall, I think that's where college football is trending. We'll see what the Big Ten does when they go to 16 teams. We'll see what the SEC does when they go to 16 teams. The ACC has already announced it's going away with divisions. The Pac-12 is doing it this year. They had the flexibility to do it because of the 12-team league, nine-team or nine-game conference schedule. But I think that's where we're going to end up, where the best two teams play and you get some sort of more regular rotation through both what are now sides of the conference. And I understand even if you go to one big league and do away with divisions, you still have to have those traditional rivalry yes. games that get played. Michigan has to play Ohio State every year. That's just the way it has to work. And it feels like every other game in the Big Ten is some sort of rivalry with some sort of trophy at stake. So figuring out how you're going to do that, especially with USC and UCLA coming into the league, Figuring out how you're going to do that is going to be tough. I mean, Kevin Warren and his crew are going to have a tough time figuring out how to do it. But when you're talking about an expanded playoff, you want to give your team, your conference, the best opportunity to get as many teams in that field as you can. One last need taken for Michigan. And it was Andy Maddox that gets a chance to do the honors. Jim Harbaugh had seven different quarterbacks today complete at least one pass. So... The largest home shutout since 1975, 59 to nothing will be your final Michigan over UConn. And now the Big Ten schedule starts next week for number four. And now we're really going to learn about Michigan going forward. The first three games, they operated with a very business-like approach, dispatching of inferior opponents. The defense has been absolutely fantastic. 110 yards given up this game. The offense was efficient, but next week it gets real. Roddy Jones and Chris Button, I'm Bob Wachusen, saying so long from Ann Arbor. 59 to nothing. Michigan wins it going away against UConn. Time to head back to the studio and Kevin Nagani. Bob, thank you so much. Letting you know we've got some good games going on. Syracuse, Purdue back and forth right now. 25-23 over on ESPN2. Cincinnati in control over on ESPNU and Virginia up 10 nothing final minute of that first half on the ACC network reminding you we have Ole Miss Georgia Tech coming your way Michael Trigg and uh, by the way the Rebels seeking their second straight 3-0 start under Lane Kiffin they can get this W on the road at Georgia Tech and Trigg coming off three touchdowns tying a program record against Central Arkansas uh, Marcus Freeman uh oh uh oh, is right. Notre Dame, and they pulled out the green jerseys. That's not good. It, it's this is a stunner, and I know it's still early, but right now Notre Dame down seven nothing to Cal at home. Yeah, the Notre Dame defense, which is Marcus Freeman's specialty, yeah. lets them down this season. I, I have to. We saw the over against Ohio State. It, it was like the air just came out of them. Yeah, and, and you expect more out of this team. And, and although you want to preach patience, 
you just wonder how patient they'll be if they can't turn this around. And let's not forget, that offense has struggled to put up yes, points. Yes, exactly. So if you're down 7 nothing, it's going to be a long afternoon. We'll keep you up to date on how that game plays out. Okay, early touchdowns. We saw that in Nebraska and Oklahoma for the Huskers. Mickey Joseph taking over. Scott Frost fired. So, Joseph, the interim feeling good because they score first. And then after that, Oklahoma said enough. Dylan Gabriel. Yeah, I love the play call. Quarterback draw. The running back leads up in the hole. Defense doesn't account for the quarterback running easy touchdown. What do you make of the Sooners so far under Brent Venables? For me, it's their defense, Kev. We know what their offense is going to be under offensive coordinator Jeff Levy, but their defense led by head coach Brent Venables has been outstanding. A little trickeration there. You saw Braden Willis, Demarcus Major, and Oklahoma all over Nebraska, 49-14. to 14. Updating you, it's not been a good day for the Big Ten. Western Kentucky... That game in the final four minutes there leading Indiana. Northwestern trailing Southern Illinois. Is that a final? Yes, it is. Rutgers up 10-7 to against Temple and Purdue down three on the road. Not a good day for the Big Ten. Not at all. Can we have a good day from Jeff Sims? We're waiting for that breakout performance. We've been waiting for that for a while ever since his freshman season. Absolutely. Georgia Tech Ole Miss coming your way after this. That's all 